So in um, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, the title of the lesson is Don't Be Blinded by Artificial Love. And it says here in verse 4, the God of this age, and I will make an emphasis, small g-o-d, so you'll see the small g-o-d, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your servants for Jesus Christ. You know, the God of this age is real. It's Satan. If you really think about it, everything in this world does not teach, except when you're with people of God in the Bible or coming, like right now, hearing the Bible. Everything else, no one really stops to, to allow the presence or speak God or really show people the truth. What are the artificial symptoms of love out there? Well, trying to find love in, in all the wrong places. You know, there's a song, looking for love in all the wrong places. Sounds good, but it's a nightmare. It's an old country song, really, looking for love in all the wrong places. But that's what we do uh, when we don't really want to go to God. We, we, we look for God. We try to find that love with another person not built on God. And you realize two sinners together... Uh, without the love of Christ and building it on God, it's, it, it's not gonna, it's not going to really work as amazing as it would as going being right with God. Yeah. What do you look for love? You look for love. Artificial love is telling you that you'll be comforted, you'll be okay, and that can come from food, that can come from alcohol, drugs, materialism. Success in and of itself is not wrong. Material is not wrong. But if you're looking for that, for your satisfaction, your comfort, because what is love? Love is something where you feel safe. You feel good. You feel like it's pleasing you. From a person in relationships, look how terrible the world is turning out as a, as a, as a whole. Um, if you look at the people and the situations and the, 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 the dissension, the divisions, the hatred, the, the, the lack of love, and then all the leaders and the politicians and the world leaders all have band-aids for us. They tell us if we educate more, then we'll stop shooting each other or robbing each other. No, no. Y your heart is still evil even if you become educated. You still can, you just become insulated. You're insulated from having to deal, but you're selfish. What does blind mean? Blinded from love, because if you're not seeing, if you're blinded, if Satan blinds us to really not like what I love what Parker said, the intellectual belief of the scripture about Jesus. Jesus died for us on the cross. Many of us have grown up. Most people have heard about that Jesus dying on the cross, but it's just intellectual, even though it's true, it's powerful, but it's not powerful to the person Unless, I think Parker said it best, take responsibility. When you take responsibility, you realize, wow, now you're going to understand that love when you stand before God and realize you need the cross of Christ. You need God's love. You need God's forgiveness. And you need to be transformed. Look in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. When I was... I mean, I don't know about you guys, but uh, the, the, the uh, getting along with people without grace and forgiveness and patience and kindness, it doesn't work very well. Uh, in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, it says, since the children, since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. See, the devil, the God of this age, he can't hold you down if you come and want to get right with God and you start to really come to the true God Almighty. You have to seek him, though. You got to want to seek him. It's a free choice. 
pure unconditional love must be free will. Each person gets to decide without any threats or compulsion or anything like you get, right? Sonia married me because she thought I was going to be a movie star. Now she's lost out. I'm just, I'm just a little, little town minister, I mean, but she still loves me. I'm just kidding, but that's what, that's what unconditional love is. When you come together, it doesn't care. I don't care what your background is. If you love someone, I don't care where you come from. I don't care. I love you. But look at this. Jesus said, since we have flesh and blood and he created us, he shared in our humanity. So that by his death, Jesus dying on the cross, his death, he might break the power of him, the satanic lies, him who holds the power of death, that is the devil. And then once that happens, you're free and he frees those who all their lives were held in slavery by fear of death. What does that mean, fear of death? Well, we're all going to die. It doesn't take faith to know you're going to die, but most people don't think that way. But, but the fear of death is no one really wants to think until you really embrace the cross and go, I need to figure it out. I need answers. I want to know really where I go when I die. And I'm going to not, I'm going to quit going by my imagination and my emotional thought process because I'm always favoring me. If you're honest about yourself, you favor you. You don't think you're that bad. There's always worse people. And that's not to make yourself feel low esteem. But it's to make yourself go, who am I really and where am I with God? And then you have to step out. And if you're really honest, you'll embrace an outside authority, which is the scriptures. And the scriptures isn't just a storybook to read and then not move. It's to, it's to respond. It's a relationship. God's revealing who he is, why Jesus came, what does he want from us? He wants a relationship. And as you read the truth and then come by faith, you start to step into a real understanding of love and a relationship with the invisible true God. And the artificial holds on you now start to break because they don't have meaning like they did. And you're not afraid to die and you don't even think about it, but you're secure because you know you're going to die. I realized when I started really thinking about this, I was... 31. And it really hit me where I go, I believe in God. And someone invited me to church and I started studying the Bible. And then I started going, I started saying, am I, where am I really if I die? I mean, I was raised in a family that, you know, uh, as a baby, I was baptized and, you know, I believed in Jesus, but I didn't do, I didn't, I started thinking, well, why did I do that? I didn't even know what, I didn't have any say in this. Yeah. I don't even know what I'm doing. And I sure wasn't living the right way. And that's when I went, I started to just go, where will I, what, what, where am I really at with God? And that's when I started asking the people that were studying the Bible, show me answers. And the answers challenged me because I had to be honest. I had, I wasn't going to just go, whatever, I'm right. God knows my heart. No, I started to look at the Bible and I go, no, not only did I not know that I don't, I have never been, I'm not living that way. I don't even have a focus on that. I don't even know how to live the way God wants so I had to be brave. I had to be, I had to be courageous to step in and go, God, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to look in the mirror with your scriptures and just, uh, what, where am I at? What's going on? And oh my gosh, it was a life-changing journey and I'll never regret it, but it was embraceive. I cha it changed everything. My whole direction, mind, heart, and soul changed everything. And it wasn't like a rule book or a guidebook. It was the power of the cross and love and the awesome understanding of what it means and where I want to go, because God doesn't put me anywhere. I get to decide where I go. Yeah. I'm either going to be with God on God's terms of love, yeah. or I'm going to decide not to be. And then see, the deception is the God of this age deceives a lot of people to believe that in his artificial God fakeness, bringing up God and Jesus, the word Jesus even, he makes people think they're right with God when they're not. Yeah. Because they don't understand what it means to walk with God the way Jesus defines in the Bible anymore than a man on a moon. Yeah. So that's, if you really think about it, it's ridiculous if you haven't verified, really, where am I at? Right. On, so point number one is, do you believe how much God loves you? Do you believe how much God loves you? How much he loves you? 
Well, let's look at Ecclesiastes 3 to get into this. Most people that believe in God but say, I believe God loves me. Do you believe God loves you? Yeah. But then you go, really, do you? Because if, if you were followed around, if you really believed how much God loves you, then you believe that you're safe. So why are you freaking out during different situations? Why do you go up and down and all around? Why do you stress and get, and, and get fearful consistently? You're stressed out. Not that we won't have some of that because you're going to go quick to God. But a lot of times, if you really believe God loves you, the almighty, powerful creator. If you really believe he loves you that much, that means, he, that means you're okay. Look in Ecclesiastes 3.9. Uh, let's understand, let's go back to how God works on everyone in the world. What do workers gain from their toil? Well, I'd say not much. Because when you die, you can't take it with you. And he's saying a time for this. He goes to the time for that. And before that, he's talking about everything. And don't get me wrong. We need to work hard. We need to build a life. We need to be responsible. It's even important to even think, hey, as I live my life, if God allows me to be old, uh, let me think about how am I going to plan to, to, when I get older, financially, you, you got to why use your brain. Yes. But what do you gain? Look in verse ten. It says, "I have seen the burden God has laid on the human race. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. I know that there's nothing better for people than to be happy." And do good while they live. That each one of them may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all their toil. This is the gift of God. I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it or, or nothing taken from it. God does it so that people will fear him. See, here's Solomon a man that had everything at his beck and call, wealth, finances, everything. And even though he did have everything, he still went, what am, what am I building without God? What is it worth? It's meaningless. And he continued to end up going, meaningless, meaningless. And then God allowed and inspired him to share what he's found by his empty pursuits, even though he had everything. And he goes, man, I know it's a hard. God's put a burden on us. To work hard. Life is tough. Let's just be real at times. Yeah. But he also says he's made it beautiful in his time. When you get touching with God's love, it's, it, it's a timing issue. Are you responding to God's timing? But then, and then I love the theme of this is he also set eternity in the human heart, yet they cannot fathom what God has done in the beginning and then. Whenever he comes out of the womb, it's so to speak, God has set eternity in the heart of people. Like beautiful Ayla. Uh, Amy and Chaz's babies back there. One month and one day, right? One month and one day. One month and one day old. Well, when Ayla came out or in whatever, God God stamps God stamps in the womb or whatever. God says He stamps He sets eternity in the human heart. What does that mean? Forever and ever. Contentment, forever and ever with God. But it says we can't fathom it. So everybody is stamped, so to speak, with a void. I think it's like eternity, and you can't feel it. And that's why the artificial love that Satan is trying to blind people with, people are running after everything, trying to fill that void, and it's always going to end up falling short because God did that. You can't be fully content without coming to God. And hopefully in your lifetime, if you die not really humbling out like that, then you're going to miss your timing. Because everyone's eternity is fixed at death. So God has set eternity in the human heart. That's what disturbed me, and it makes so much sense now. I went after everything before when I was before I at 31 started really pursuing like what is the answer to life? But no matter what I did, college grad, military, Italy. Acting, women, relationships, 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 relationships. 
drugs, alcohol, success, SAG card, Screen Actors Guild, company, Klopek Investment Management. That, that was like a left. That was, that was, but no matter what, if I got away from God or before I got right with God, it, it always ended up meaningless. I had to keep running and finding something. I just, it's just, it didn't. That's where I got into the cocaine and the drugs is because it, it gave me that feeling I kept chasing after because I realize now in hindsight, it, I couldn't fill it with anything else. And I'm not making excuses, but I was just going, I could not be content even though I had a lot of stuff. It was, this re it was like a restlessness. I was like a restless wanderer and I didn't know how to explain it then. But now I know it's that eternity that I found when I started to get right with God and study the Bible. I went, oh, oh. And I realized that's so powerful to have that filled by God on God's terms and the truth. Yes. See, setting eternity in the human heart means that we can never be completely satisfied with earthly pleasures or pursuits. Yes. God did that on purpose. Why? Because we were created in God's image. So that means we're going to naturally have a spiritual thirst and, and we have artificial, even if we're brought up in religion that has Jesus, until you study the Bible and start to qualify what you've been taught or thought, is it fit into the scriptures or is it false doctrine? You have to be honest with that because yeah. God can't let you come through a half truth. You have to be willing to humble out in his truth to activate the faith and connection with God. There's no falsehood. So we have a spiritual thirst. We have an eternal value. That's what you have to understand too. When you have that eternity in your heart, you, you also re realize that there's a value to you. God loves you. You're not just another human person in a number. He's like, you have value. I've stamped your heart with eternity because you have eternal value to me. That's what God's saying to you and me. You have eternal value. It's not even running this lifetime. I want you now, but I want you to go on and forever with me. And then once again, nothing but the eternal God will truly satisfy you. He's built a restlessness, a yearning in us that just, it just, you don't know how to get there without getting right with God. Let's look at Luke chapter 15, verse 11. You guys with me? See, to be happy and do good while we live are worthy goals in life. Ecclesiastes just said that, right? Be happy. I know there's nothing else. Be happy, do good. That's what we all want. We want happiness. God knows that. But there's an internal seeking God with all your heart. God doesn't use happy are those. He says, blessed are those who seek me with all your heart. Blessed is different than happy. Happy, he could have said that, but he didn't. Happy is a feeling that's momentary as long as things are going well. Like marriage, right? If you're in a marriage, you know it's you're not you're not happy if you're at really odds with your wife and you got in an argument and you haven't resolved it yet and you're at work. You're not. You, there's a restlessness in you because if you love your spouse, you really can't do anything else well till you get back because if you, your family, that's your family, that's your wife or husband, and then you know if you have children too, that's your family, and it starts here. If children get insecure if they don't see the spouses really in love. They're not faking it. People can sense it. But you know that, right? But the happy and do good while we live are worthy goals for life. But we can pursue them in the wrong way. And that's what the God of this age has blinded people with. Pursuit of happiness in your, outside of God's boundaries, doing it your way, leaving God out. God wants a relationship. He wants us to be humble and obey and trust him. But he wants us to enjoy life. Let's look at Luke 15, verse 11. Point number two is, do you feel lavished by God's love? Now, lavished is just like overwhelmed and just covered more and more. Like you can't believe it. They take your, they take your coat at the door. They give you a, a, what you want to drink. Come on in here, sit we're here, sit here. It's comfortable. Even the guy that owns the house gets up out of his chair and goes, hey, no, no, you sit here. You sit here. You're just like, what? Every second I just feel so loved in, with this person. You, that's what God says. And let's look at this in, in Luke 11. See, 
Eternity in the heart means that you need to figure it out. When you go, everybody, God's patient. So you're out there and, it's, and, and God wants you to find him. And until you become old enough, mature enough as a teenager, uh, so to speak, you can't even really mature enough to understand darkness and light. You got to go into darkness. Otherwise, Jesus didn't need to die for you. He needed to die for the sin of the world. So everyone has to understand they need God. So in a sense, this story is going to make a lot of sense for all of us. In verse 11, it says, Jesus continued. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me the share of my estate. So he divided his property between them. Not longer after that, the son, the younger son, got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth and wild living. While after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in, in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like the one of your hired hands, servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was a st long way off, so long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to the father, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to the servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a finger, put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. See, this is really a relationship with God. A lot of people misunderstand the prodigal son, the lost son. This guy and the father, really the story of the father is God, making the simulation that God is that father. He already was with him when we're born we grow up, God created us, but then we have to make a choice to want to stay and live with him and want to be with him and be a son. Yeah. This guy got, this son got old enough and obviously did not see the truth of God because yeah. he wasn't happy. He goes, I'm out. This is not, uh, there's more. I don't want you. I don't want this. And why do I say that? It's disrespectful, second son, even in that culture, to interrupt and go, I want my stuff. Yeah. And then he goes not only just, on the other side of town, he leaves for good, a distant country. He goes way away, no relationship anymore. I'm done. I don't want it. I don't want what I have. I don't like, I'm not content with God. Wow. And see, a lot of us run around, myself included, and that was kind of me. Even though God was always going, I love you, I love you, I go, I, I want my stuff. I'm going to do it my way. And God allowed and still gave me success and prosper but I was still meaningless because that void, I never understood it. Yeah. But look what the key is here in verse 16. When one really wants to get right with God, they got to get to a point where they really understand their need for God. And that's why Jesus even warns people of materialism and wealth. He never says it's sin, but he says it will insulate people and blind them from ever really getting right with God. He says, he says, you know, uh, it's, it, it, the love of money, not money, the love of money brings you to ruin. Uh, it, it's harder for a rich man in the kingdom. It's, it's talking about if you are successful, you may miss really understanding how to get right with God. But it's not wrong. That's what he's saying. If you're content, you don't understand you're missing God. And see, this person, in verse 16, he longed to fill his stomach. But when he was full with his wealth, he says he squandered his wealth. 
So when he had his wealth, he was all good. Didn't think about God, I'm fine. When you're running on that artificial blinded by unbeliever, he was blinded by that artificial love because he didn't really see a need for God till things ran out that are temporary. And everything that you're trusting in besides God runs out. Only when he blew it all and did it all, and he finally, and some of us, unfortunately, people in the world, and myself included, I had to get down in the dumps to a point where I realized I was emotionally bankrupt. And even though I claimed God, I wasn't, I was prideful until I really went and found people that could show me instead of just popping in out of church going, how you doing? I'm right with God. You know, I, you know, I, I just was, you know, my relationship with God was so personal that no one knew I had it. I just no, no one knew. It's my personal relationship. And then I looked at the Bible. The Bible says it's not supposed to be so quiet. You're supposed to share and one. But it was so, it was me and God. It's not your business. But I was empty. And I got to a point where the drugs got me into a situation where I continued to control it as a functioning addict. What that means, it's a, terrible. It means that you can continue to hold jobs, get promotions, graduate from college, but you're dying, you're dying inside. It's almost worse. It, 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 you think, it's pride. You think you're, you're able to hold it. But look what this says in the person. And this is for everybody. It's not just this poor guy. It says he longed to fill his stomach with the pods of the pigs reading, but no one gave him anything. That's God's love right there. God allowed him to get to a point to go, here's another time that I hope you see because of your choices walking away. No one gave him anything. Well, who let that happen? God insulated him where sometimes if you're really doing terrible and you don't, you can't, no matter what, it's not working. That's probably God going, I'm stopping everyone from assisting you or giving you anything. You're miserable and you're not getting out of this. It, it feels terrible, but it's a blessing. No one gave him anything. And only then, because of God's love of even putting him in this misery, allowing him to get to this place, what happened? Verse 17. Then he came to his senses. What's that mean? Spiritually. Well, this is a spiritual, obviously a parable from Jesus. It's coming to your senses. I need God. I need God, even though God created me and God's loved me. I, now, when I, when, I, when I was old enough to mature wise, he was, went out and said, I'm going to make my own decisions. And the father said, no, you need to stay here. This is the way it's set up. He was sad, but he let him go because God's going to let you do what you want to do. No one's going to crowbar you in the church. I think it's funny how, I mean, I've had people say sometimes like, they're not going to get me. They're not going to convert me. Well, we don't want you. <laughs> Believe me, I don't mean that in the wrong way, but no one's trying to convert nobody. That's a scary thing. If I had that pressure on me, I would have fell away a long time ago. <laughs> I got to convert someone. Oh my gosh, I'm just trying to stay alive spiritually. I'm just going to share what God's helping me to do. And let me show you. I remember I had a, a boy, there was a boyfriend of my of my sister a long time ago. I think I just got converted. And she was all up in arms because I had shared with her. And she was staying with us for a little while. And I just became a Christian. I was reading my Bible and at the in, at the counter in the morning. I didn't even know I was doing this. But she went and told my family members. He's whistling and reading the Bible. In the morning, he whistles. I didn't know I was whistling. I'm not that good of a whistler. But I think I was just like, yeah, I must have been joyful reading the Bible. But it makes it sound more sinister when you say it that way. He reads his Bible and whistles. And then she was telling her boyfriend, and, and, and they were like, they got afraid. And he goes, well, he's not going to convert me. He's not going to convert me. I said, listen, dude, I'm not going to, I'm not going to convert you. But I, let's go on your boat still, because he wanted to give me a ride on his boat. I said, but, I, but I said, don't worry. Don't worry. I'm not going to get you. I don't know what that means. I'm going to get you. Here they come. You got to want to. You got to come to your senses. Spiritually speaking, when you feel like I'm bankrupt, I need God. And see, if you, if you, if you if we look at it like the guy living in the gutter. No, you could have five cars, seven degrees, and run five companies and have a Learjet. And unfortunately, you haven't come to your senses that you're bankrupt spiritually. Yeah. And see, because we become good moral people, educated good moral people, that's not the standard. Jesus died for you to become a disciple of his and live for him, no longer yourselves. So he came to his senses, and then decisions happen. See, oh, and he goes, in verse 17, he says, how many of my father's hired hands, uh, hired servants have food to spare, and I'm here starving to death. 
And then he says, I will set out and go back to my father. That's a decision. I'm going to get right with God. But see, he, his mindset was even changed because when he was there, he didn't even see himself the blessings that God said. You're, uh, you're with me. He started thinking, I'll just go back. And even if I could be a servant, a ranch hand, that'd be amazing. But back in that point, that way he would have looked at even worse because he split. It was nothing good. See, your perspective is destroyed if you don't get humble. You got to get humble. Yes. And he says, man, I'm going to go back. And then in verse 19, he goes, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. So see, that's humility. You just get broken and you go, God, just show me the way. Please show me the Bible. Help me teach. Let me learn. Let me understand what I need to do. And then... He goes back and he's so humble and he's repentant. I've sinned against you. I sinned against heaven. I, I, whoever else I need to talk to, I'm just, I'm, I just want to get right. What do I need to apologize? What do I need to do to anyone? And the young man, this man, changed his mind about himself and his situation. See, repentance—you must change your mind about yourself and your situation when you and, and really stand before God, not in fear, but in humility. He admitted he was a sinner and he admitted he doesn't know how to live God's way. And it's God's goodness, not just our badness, that leads us to repentance. Amen. See, sometimes we think, oh, oh, oh yeah, you got to own your sin because it's killing you if you're honest. It's, it, it, it puts distance between people. There's weirdness if you're not a kind, friendly person. There's awkwardness. You got to love like Jesus. If you have something against somebody, you know if they're in the room, how you feel. You, no matter how well you're like, you're like a mafia guy going, how you doing? I'm going to kill, I'm going to shoot you tonight. <laughs> right? You can't lie. You, you know you're messed up. You want to be clear with everyone. Look in Romans 2, 4. Lavished by God's love. Romans 2, 4. But, but see, it's not your badness that just gets you. Because see, once you come to your senses and you go back, you realize that what, what did God do? He didn't say, well, it's about time. We need to get in there and you need to get broken and cry a lot before you get right with me. No, he says, man, I love you so much. I already see you understand. You want to follow me. You want to be right. You want to be in my house. You want to live by my rules because I love you. Amen. And look what it says in verse 4. Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? Isn't that great? God's kindness even gives you repentance. I realize God's so kind with us. You guys should realize that. Even as you walk with God, we still we need grace. But you realize even sometimes as a disciple, you realize once you come to your senses, because that's what we're doing over and over, right? Repentance is like, well, that wasn't right. God, please help me. And you realize in spite of that, he still blesses you. And you're like, God, I want to, I, I, I'm grateful to repent. I can't believe how much you love me and just continue to love me. Yeah. Right? Yeah. He never does what, what we really deserve. He goes, I love you, man. Yeah. I don't think he says man, but you know. <laughs> so go back to um, 1 John chapter 3. Because do you feel lavished by God's love? Now that's a deeper word, right? And I'm not just making that word up. 1 John 3. Uh, is, is a great word because I love how it says it. It says, because see, if you don't feel loved by God and understand God loves you so much, every day you should get up and before you even get out of bed, go, good morning, God. Amen. Thank you for loving me so much. I want to love you today. And then go, you know, get ready and have some quiet time, look at the Bible. But just realize that. Because until you really every day go, God loves me so much and be reminded you don't have to, you're going to walk out going, I'm grateful. God's right here with me. I'm grateful. And it says in 1 John 3, 1, see what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. The God of this age has blinded people. It says, dear friends, verse 2, now we are children of God and what we will be has not yet been made known, but we know that when Christ appears, second coming, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. All of us who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. That means you're changing, you're, you're repenting, you're walking in the light of love of God. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know 
that he appeared so that he might take away our sins. And in him there's no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen or known him. Pretty awesome. Lavished. 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 Sumptuously rich. Elaborate or luxurious. Very generous. Extravagant. It's what it says in the meanings, right? Bestow something in generous or extravagant quantities. That's what, that's what they got, the Bible used that word, lavished. It's not just, I know God loves me. I got, you love me. I am hope you have some crumbs for me, God. Help me through it. No. It's like, it's like you are that person that he's saying, come in my house. Here's the ring. Here's the robe. Here's everything. And the best everything. Let's celebrate. He wants all of us with him, dear children. The Father, he says, what great love the Father has lavished on us. But if you don't come to your senses and try to be, think you're right with God when you don't get right with God the way Jesus defines, you're going to be really shocked because you're never going to feel what you mean. And you're always going to feel a little outside. Not because we do that, because God's spirit won't be in you. Yeah. You can't, God's, God will not be in someone that is... Uh, Blinded or, or, or is still not in full truth. You cannot be with God unless you're admitting the full truth, not part truth. It's got to be pure truth to agree and be and to have grace. Amen. Come on, Chris. Look in verse 7. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous just as he is righteous. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil. Because the devil's been sinning from the beginning, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. No one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning because they have been born of God. What does that mean? Well, this is the false doctrine of the lies that gives out. God's seed really means God's spirit. A seed is growth. When do you get the spirit of God? See, the counterfeit lies of the love, the blinds of believers, most, everybody, got, Satan knows that. I, everybody wants a form of godliness. That's why there's churches and different denominations and everybody claiming God and using some of the Bible. But people have to find the truth. It's the best counterfeit if you're not really looking for it. It's like find out why you, what, what they're doing. Don't just sit there and go, ah, oh, nice to be here. It feels spiritual because they're singing and they read some scripture. Yeah. Even the devil believes in, in God's word yeah. and shudders. Yeah. The devil could be sitting in here going, and leave. Yeah. You're not supposed to sit and leave. You're supposed to come to your senses consistently and grow more like Jesus and go, how do I? You're not, a, you're, you're not the church is not. It's not something that you just sit in. You are the church when you become part of God's family. God's family is the church. The seed, the seed, look in Acts 2, 38. See, no one born of God will continue to sin because God seeds in them. See, when you really actually get right with God, honestly, and once again, we can only show you the way because God says make disciples of all nations. So we just share. But then you got to do heart work as you go. And if you're not willing to be honest before God's word, you're just playing, and you can't play God. Yeah. You can play church, but you can't play God. Oh, no. yeah. And it says in verse 38, Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you, your children, and all who are far off. That's us. We were all really far off 2,000 years ago. For all whom the Lord our God would call. With many other words, he warned them. He pleaded with them. Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who what? Accepted his message were baptized. What's the message? Repent. Yeah. Come to your senses and understand Jesus is Lord. Jesus was sent by God the Father for you to change, not only understand and get in touch of why Jesus needed to die for you so you can really authentically take responsibility, like Parker said, and stand in the grace. Now there's no lying in you at all. Isn't that great to be a disciple when there's no secrets, no lies? You're only as sick as your secrets. Isn't it great to go, there's nothing that I have. That it's, I mean, in the world, I, I you know, I, I, I just kind of lied as I went. I mean, you know, yeah. 
The phone rings. I'm not here. Well, well I am here. I had to learn to talk again because that's a lie. I'd have to say, hey, if that's for me, tell them I'll call them back. That's fair. Yes. You might say, oh, that's corny. No, you got to really be honest. Exactly. You got to work on being completely, purely honest with God. That's what the freedom of the cross is. And if you lied, you get to go, God, I, and God says, stop, go to, go to that person. See, you can't just go to God. You got to go to the person you damaged or lied to and go, I'm really sorry. And then you come to God and he forgives you. This is the seed, the Spirit, Holy Spirit. God doesn't give the Holy Spirit to someone who's not authentically right with God. That would just deceive more people. That's what the God of this age is loving, blinding all the uh, unbelievers to make them think they're right with God. But they've been, they, they haven't authenticated and, and really walked through and go, who am I and what do you teach and what do you do? Last point is, do you feel, la I mean, uh, excuse me, the, 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 the last scripture I want to go to is, go back to uh, 1 John. 1 John chapter 3, 1 John chapter 3, and it says here in, in, um, in verse 8, no one who does what is sinful, I mean, the one who does what is sinful is of the devil because the devil's been sinning from the beginning. We all need grace, but it's the pattern's broken. We no longer live in that direction. We're striving to live for Jesus as Lord, following his word, striving to live. And if we, if we are in sin, we quickly change it in the grace of God. So the one who, so the unconfessed sin, that's the first step in forming what the Bible actually says is backsliding in the church. And I'm talking to the members. If you start to just let little, you might think there are little sins go. You start to get attitudes in your heart. You start to keep reservations, then trust, distrust, you start to think distrustfully. See, if we're in the light, we're all in the light. We, 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 we need to be humble, but we're all in the light. So if we're all in the light of God, we're all in the light of God. So we have the responsibility to be honest, so love always trusts. But see, if you start to let sins go, you start to backslide. Uh, Jeremiah 3.22 says, return faithless, faithless people, I will cure you of backsliding. Yes, we will come to you, for you are, you are the Lord our God. Uh, so that's, 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 I want to challenge people in the church. If you're in secret sin and you're not dealing with it and you continue to sin, I don't know what you're doing because you're living in sin and it's not getting it done saying every day you're sorry to God. You need to change. You don't just sin again. Sorry. That's like not real. Someone punches me in the face, says sorry. Next day punches me in the face, says sorry. The third or fourth day, I'm going to go, I don't think you're sorry. You keep punching me straight up. You're not changing. What are you doing to change it? What, what, where are you getting your strength from? See what I'm saying? That's really how you have to look at it. Why are you still in sins that you know you need to repent and change? Go to God. And uh, the last scripture is 1 John 4. Go there. This is perfect. And I want to just tell you that the last point is get rid of bitterness to get better. It's get, get bitter or get better. But if you look at, uh, in 1 John 4, uh, 18, it says, there's no fear in love. But perfect love drives out fear because love has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We loved, we love because he loved first, verse 19. See, if you don't understand that, that's why you haven't responded yet. We love because when you understand and study the Bible and really so God help me, I want to seek you, you go, oh my gosh, he's loved me no matter what's been going on. I just didn't understand the direction on what I need to do and how I come to him. We love because he loved first. Every day you wake up, I love you. Thank you. Amen. If you're enveloped in right with God, that's where you are. That's where you stay, even in problems, even in pain. You stay in pain and go, God, I know there's a reason for this because you love me. So bitterness gets in there. I'm not going to go to it, but the older brother came back. He got bitter. He was in, so to speak, God's house. Not right. As far, he was far, as far as the sun was when he squandered it. You know, he later he says, that son of yours squandered and was with prostitutes and just tried to, you know, the worst living he was trying to say. That son 
even though he did everything but quiet reservations and bitterness, he was far as far away from God as the son that went to the distant country. But he was in church, so to speak, God's house. Crazy bitter. And he didn't even finish repenting. God even said, I love you. Everything's been yours. Everything, everything you have is yours. But he didn't change. And see, if you don't change and forgive, if there's one person you have an attitude with, you're in really bad place because you don't understand the cross. You need to come forward and forgive and love no matter who they are. If you don't agree with them, if you're mad at them, if you're, you have to love. Love your enemy. You have to pray to God to love. You can't love unless you come to the cross. It just doesn't work. You're not engineered humanically wise to love. You got to get rid of bitterness. And, and the love of God gets rid of bitterness. Don't be blinded by artificial love. Understand and believe how much God loves you, but don't stay there. You got to really go even farther and go, I understand how much God's love he lavishes on me. You should feel like every day it's like, oh, I am so grateful. And then capture those little feelings in your heart. And bitterness starts with forgiving and being clear with people. And don't look at anyone without a huge smile if you're a Christian. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name. Amen.